All right, we're going to start with uh, today's lesson. All right, it's going to be uh, <clears throat> today's November 27, 2022, and we continue with the book of Revelation, chapter 3, from verses 7 to 13, and it talks about the church in Philadelphia. So let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for giving us another day of life. We thank you for allowing us once more, like you do every Sunday, to be here and to share the word of God with people that are present and people who are watching in video. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity that a lot of other places of the country do not have and uh, give us your inspiration, your wisdom, your strength to carry on with this uh, lesson. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, we're going to start with uh, uh, verses from 7 <clears throat> to 13. I'm going to read the text and then we analyze verse by verse. Verse 7, to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. Of course, talking about Christ. What he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be, claim to be Jews, Though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have, so no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right. Uh, let's start with verse 7. Edward, can you read verse 7, please? <clears throat> can you read verse 7? To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Okay, Philadelphia right now is, is called uh, al -Ashair. That's the name of that city right now uh, in, uh, in Turkey. The word means brotherly law, Philadelphia. A lesser city than the other's address. It was located about 38 miles southeast of Sardis. A city of commercial importance, conveniently located as a gateway of the high central plateau of the Roman province of Asia and Asia Minor. Asia Minor was uh, a province of Rome. It was not the continent, it was just a part of it. Its chief deity was Dionysus, <clears throat> the guy of wine. Um, also, uh, the Romans called it Bacchus, the god of wine. So the, in, the, in the Greek mythology, they have all these gods, and uh, Roman mythology took over, and they just changed the names. And then it starts here, of oh, him, which is Christ, who is holy. Holy is a description of God himself. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, was a song of the seraphs, which Isaiah heard in Isaiah 6.3. All through the Old Testament, God is a holy one. And now that title is given to a recent Christ. To say that Jesus Christ is holy is to say that he shares the being of God. This is a divine attribute elsewhere in Revelation, so that the use of it here strengths or suggests Jesus' deity. The idea of true carries connotations of Jesus being the true Messiah, who has begun to fulfill messianic prophecy, though he is rejected by the Jews as a false messia messianic pretender. In Greek, there are two words for true. One is alitis, and the other one is alitintinos. Alitis means true in a sense that the true statement is different from a false statement. The other word means real as opposed to that which is unreal. It is the second of these words, real and unreal, which is used here. Jesus is real, and Jesus is reality. When we are confronted with him, we are confronted with no shadowy outline of the truth, but with the truth itself. Sometimes we are, in the Old Testament, we see shadows of the Messiah, but now we have the real Messiah. He is who has the key of David, who opens and no man will shut, who shuts and no man opens. We might first note that the key is a symbol of authority. 
Here is a picture of Jesus Christ as the one who has a final authority, which no one can, can question. Sometimes in the, uh, in the jokes that we make, our religious jokes, it says somebody died and went to heaven, and Peter was there in the front. Peter was not in front, you know. It's, uh, it's a joke, you know, but it's okay. You can, you can laugh at it. But it's, it's Jesus who has the final authority. Let me read verse 8. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Uh, what do you mean by open door? What is, a, what is the meaning of an open door? One of the meanings could be that uh, there is a door of missionary opportunity before every man and, and does not have to go to go overseas to find it. Within the home, within the circle in which we move, within the church in which we attend, there are those who be won by Christ or for Christ. To use that door of opportunity is at once our privilege and our responsibility. Sometimes uh, people think that, uh, oh, if I was, uh, uh, I don't want to go to a, a missionary to Africa or South America or whatever, you don't have to go that far. You can go to Jersey City <laughs> and be a missionary there. You can be in your own church. There are a lot of people that come to the church that do because uh, of social pressure, not of conviction. So your missionary work can start right here where you are. You don't have to go that far. All right? That's what it says here. It's a privilege and a responsibility. Number two, the way that Christ sees this, the reward for work well done is more work to do. I remember sometimes when I was in another church, uh, somebody brought back the question, um, what do I get if I become a member of the church? And I say, what you get is more work. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you're going to, you're going to put your crown there, and you're going to relax, and you're going to give orders to people, right? No. Being a member of the church means more work for the church. I mean, more work for God. So there is no way around it. So the way that Christ is, is the reward for work done is more work for to do. Philadelphia has proven faithful, and the reward for her fidelity was still more work to do for Christ. Uh, we are in verse, verse 8. Number 3. It has been suggested that the mm -hmm. door which is set before the Philadelphia is not other than Jesus himself. He said, I am the door, in John 10, 7 and John 10, 9. Number four, apart from all these things, for any door the, the, of prayer, the, for any man, the door of prayer is always open. That is a door which no man can ever shut, and is one with Jesus open, when he assures men who are seeking the love of God the Father. What I'm trying to say is this, whatever the meaning is, the door is, that the door of prayer is always open. Now, you can go to church every Sunday and you can preach the word to other people and convert other people. You can go somewhere else. You can physically go to a lot of places, but suppose you are physically unable to get out. You can always watch the sermons on video or whatever. Suppose you're physically, able, you know, physically unable to move and be in bed. You can always pray. You can be a prayer warrior until the last day, until you've meant the capacity there. Mm -hmm. So no excuse for not intervening on behalf of other Christians or other unsaved. So you'll be a prayer warrior until the day you die or until your mind allows you to. Then he says, I know that you have a little strength, not because of the spiritual weakness, but because of the few uh, believers in the church, like us, you know? We are a little strength. We have a few persons in, the, in, this, in this church. Yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Despite their have a little strength, the believers in Philadelphia have obediently kept Christ's word and have not denied his name. Christ gives them power to remain in his kingdom. So once you, you, uh, you obey the commandments of Christ and comply with, with his commands, God will give you extra strength. And God will respond to your prayers even the most minute uh, ways. You know, sometimes... Uh, Sometimes your car doesn't, doesn't start, you can pray to the Lord, and the Lord responds in some way. I remember years ago when I was, uh, when I was younger, and uh, I, I was in a dire economic situation. But I was working, and I had this car that was a Hyundai, two-door, you know, I mean, very economical car, but it had nothing, not even a radio, only one mirror <laughs> and a stick shift. And, uh, but that take me, took me from here to there, and I was going all the way. And uh, if, I, if that car would have been uh, stuck, that would be dead. You know, I was living in, uh, I think, in Pomona, in Crockham County. I was working in Livingston, 
I had to go to New York. So I was working all over the place. So if my car would have stopped running, forget it. That was my life. And one day I had to work overtime. So I left about 6.30. And uh, the car started smoking, you know? So I pulled over and I said, Lord, I pray you so much, so many days, I mean daily, to protect my car. And this is what happens to, to you. So I opened the car and then across the street was a, um, a gas station, okay? I mean, that, I'm in Livingstone. You don't see my gas station there. So I pushed the car over there, and it was about 7 o'clock in the evening. So the guy opened the car, and they said, but a part is missing, you know? I mean, what do I do? I mean, it's a simple thing, right? But what, how do I get home? I mean, this is New Jersey, the Rockland County. And I said, well, let me see if I can. So he makes a phone call. And the parts store had the part. So, okay, they're going to bring it over. And I had no money. I was going to get paid two days from there. But I had my checkbook. For some reason, I had my checkbook. So I, it was like $70. I said, listen, can I post-date the check? I said, yeah. So I post-date the check, and I was on my way. Now, does God answer the prayer or not? Huh? I mean, who opens the gas station at 7 in, in the evening? And who has a part at that time? Uh -huh. who, can, who, who can take a, a post-daily check? I thought that was a, a response to a, a minute thing, but to me it was a big thing. Okay, uh, verse 9. Nico, please. Okay, the Jewish synagogue, you know, the, uh, when, the, uh, when the Jews were exiled to Babylonia, and then they came back 70 years later, a lot of them started synagogues all over the place, outside of Israel, okay? Because that was a gathering place, because the temple had been destroyed, okay? So the synagogue, like it is right now, the Jewish synagogue was a gathering place for worship. I, yesterday I was... Uh, I was uh, driving somewhere in uh, Englewood, and uh, no traffic because it was Saturday morning. But I saw a bunch of people going to the synagogue. Okay, I used to live in Manse, Rockland County, which is was uh, they, they walk because they cannot uh, take a car because that was work. I used to live in Manse, which is uh, Hasidic Jews. I think I was the only Gentile there, yeah. but uh, it was it was the safest place. <laughs> anyway, the Jewish synagogue was a gathering place for worship study and communal activities. Unsaved Jews who opposed Christians composed the synagogue of Satan, a bold metaphor directed against unbelieving and hostile Jews. This has particular significance for the Philadelphians who were being persecuted by the local Jewish community, who claimed they had represented a part of the true Israel, but this claim was a lie. Even later, rabbinical authorities condemned the Jewish community in Philadelphia for its compromise with the pagan culture. Their wealth gave him an added weight with which to attack the Christians. Christ reassures this believer that he has a key, which alone provides entry into God's kingdom. Describing verse 7 as David's house. The next verse, he says, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. In this verse, the promise of the risen Christ is that someday the Jews who slandered the Christians will kneel before them. This is an echo of an expectation of the Jews, which finds secret expression in the Old Testament. This was talking about the New Age. In the New Age, according to the Jews, all nations will do humble homage to the Jews. This promise recurs again and again in the book of Isaiah. It was a Christian belief that the Jewish nation has lost its place in the plan of God, and that place has passed it to the church. A Jew, in God's sense, on God's opinion, or the term, was not one who claimed racial descent from Abraham, but anyone or any nation of any nation who can make the same venture of faith as he had. Now, a Jew is not somebody who is born in Israel. A true Jew is a person who really seeks God with all his uh, strength. The church was the Israel of God. It was, therefore, now true to all the promises which has been made to Israel, having been inherited by the church. 
It was to her that one day all men would humble make their submission. This promise is a reversal of all the Jews, what the Jews had expected. They had expected that all nations would kneel before them, but the day was to come when they will all nations would kneel before Christ. So it was not him, it was not them that were the chosen by Christ, it was any man who follows God's command. That's what the Philadelphia church will see, at least in its beginnings, if the members will remain faithful. Up until now, they have been faithful. They might only a little strength, but the resources might be small, but if they are faithful, they will see the down the triumph of Christ. That which might keep a Christian faithful is the vision of the world of Christ. For the coming of such a world depends on the fidelity of the individual Christian. That goes for everybody. As long as an individual you keep obeying the word of God until the end, you will be saved. You will have the crown of life. Okay? It doesn't matter where you come from. You know that. But uh, the Jews have a misconception because they were the children of Abraham. They were a privileged race. No, it's not. It, there never was. They were chosen by God because God wanted. Could have been anybody. Could have been Argentinians. You know? Could have been anybody. Madagascar's. Okay? Uh, Romaine, verse 10, please. Okay, so it is a promise of the risen Christ that he who keeps will be kept. He said, you have kept my commandment, he said, therefore I will keep you. Loyalty has its sure reward. The emphasis here is on endurance. The real meaning is that the promise, the promise is to those who have practiced the same kind of endurance as Jesus displayed in his earthly life. When we are called to show endurance, the endurance of Jesus Christ supplies with three things. First, it supplies with an example. Second, it supplies with that inspiration. We must walk, look into him, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Third, the endurance of Jesus Christ is a guarantee of his sympathy. But more than that, is identification with us when we are called to endure. Now, what is sympathy? What's the difference between sympathy and identification? The difference is, for example, if you are... If you have lost a, a father or a mother, uh, a dear one, you can say, oh, I sympathize, I'm sorry that you're here, because you have not lost it. But you, if you have lost a, a also a father or mother, <clears throat> you know what they're going through. So you identify with them. Okay, it's not only a sympathy, it's identification. So Jesus identified with us because he suffered every, every bad thing that happens to people. He suffered, so he identifies with it. So he said, I know what you're going through because I, I, I went through myself. His identification with us is what we're called to endure. And in Hebrews 2.18 says, because he himself has suffered, has been tempted, he's able to help those who are tempted. Then the next page is the Jews divided into two ages, time into two ages. The present age, which is a holy bad, and the age to come, which is holy good and in between that terrible time of destruction when judgment will fall upon the world. It's to that terrible time that John refers. Ryan, John is the one who writes in this letter. Even when time comes to, uh, to the end and the world, as we know, ceases to exist, he who is faithful to Christ still will be said to be in his keeping. So what he said, he said, you know, Martin Luther, the leader of Reformation, he had a routine every day, like hope every one of us have a routine. He will get up in the morning, read his word, pray, do his gardening, and continue with his day. And somebody asked him, what would you do if the world would end tomorrow? He would say, I get up in the morning, I do my prayers, I do my reading, I do my gardening. Because the routine that you have for yourself is a routine that God approves. So you're not going to change your routine, okay? But the world acts differently. If you hear that, I've been here in this area for a long time. Every time the news tells you it's going to snow for the next three days, people rush to the supermarket to buy water and toilet paper like it's going to be the end of the world. Okay? They empty all the shelves. Uh, what happened to the, a couple of years ago, people were running to, <laughs> to buy toilet paper. Like we're going to run out. You couldn't find toilet paper in there. You know, like, uh, I don't know why. But uh, so the world reacts differently. Okay? We should not. 
Christ's promise to keep the believers from the hour of trial is more likely a promise that will remove them before the period of the tribulation. However, some take this promise to mean the believers will not be removed, but rather protected. That's another opinion to the trial. The hour of trial is another way of referring to um, unparalleled judgment of the Great Tribulation, predicted by Daniel. Verse 11, Robert. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have and say so that no one will take you down. So what does that mean? When you are saved, okay, in the final judgment, the people are going to be saved and the people will be unsaved. The people who are saved, they're not going to be judged by the salvation. They're going to be judged about the benefits that you're going to get after you were saved. People who are unsaved, they're going to be judged because they were not saved. They go to the lake of fire. So the crown refers to the, to the, to the benefits you're going to get when you get to heaven. There are levels in heaven. Okay, I'm sure that Apostle Paul is going to be in this level. But after you accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, what did you do with it? Did you exercise your talents? Did you preach? Did you that? Yeah. I have a question on that note. I mean, you know the thief on the cross? Yeah. He gave up his life, you know, pretty quickly, you know, but posthumously, I can only think over the last 2,000 years, you've had thousands and thousands of death row inmates that have made death row conversions. Will those go to his credit? Um, sure, yeah. sure. Uh, if you remember, remember that uh, guy, Sano San? Sano San, yeah, 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 yeah. He was, you know, David Berkowitz uh -huh. in Queens a few years ago. I mean, 20, more than 20 years. Uh, he used to, uh, you know, at that time, young people used to take their car to secluded places and used to make out in the cars. Yeah. He would know these places and would sneak up and used to kill these people. Of course, he was caught. Yeah. And he said, well, uh, I was listening to the son of Sam. Sam was a dog. And he was in a satanic cult. He saw, so he was sent to, of course, jail. And uh, he was given so many life sentences. Yeah. But in jail... He changed. He became to be a Christian, a pastor. Now he has a ministry in the prison. Now he knows he's never going to get out of prison, yeah. but it's okay. it's okay with him. He made amends to all the people, relatives, that, or the people he killed. And they all say he's a changed man. So he, even though he was forgiven by God, he's never going to get out of prison. He's still got to comply the penalty for men. Yes. Okay? I mean, it's God... Legal will, pardon. That's legal pardon, you're going to go to... David, too, you know... Um, when David uh, committed adultery with Bathsheba, yeah. God forgave him. But the consequences of sin, he carried through his life. Yeah. Okay, same thing. So if you are an inmate condemned to death for a crime you committed, and you're too repentant, you'll be safe. you go to heaven, but you're never going to get out of jail. Mm -hmm. Okay? So you got to pay the consequences of sin. But it doesn't matter because he's free. Even though he's in jail, he's free. Yeah. And uh, when the son says you're free, you're free indeed. Okay, let's con continue with this. Um, verse 11, the rising Christ tells them that he's coming quickly. It has been said in the New Testament that coming of Christ is, con is continually used for two purposes. First of all, number one is used as a warning to the careless and the heedless. Bless you. Jesus himself tells of the wicked servant who took advantage of his master's absence to conduct himself in an evil way, and to whom the master made a sudden return that brought judgment. Also, Paul warns the Thessalonians, or the terrible fate which awaits the disobedient and the unbelieving when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven and shall take swift and final vengeance on his enemies. Peter warns his people that they will give account of this to him who comes to judge the living and the dead. Number two, it's also uh, a comfort to the oppressed. James urges patience and endurance on his people because the coming of the Lord is drawing near. Soon their distress will be an end. The writer to the Hebrews urges patience. For soon he, will, he shall, you know, the one he's supposed to come will come. So, in the New Testament, men use the idea of the coming to Christ as a warning to the heedless and as a comfort to the oppressed. It is quite true that in the literal sense, Jesus Christ did not come back to those who were so warned and exhorted. But no man knows when eternity will invade his life. Now, this is, I want to make a, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people, some people, some preachers, especially some preachers, when they make the sermons, they constantly say, we live in the last days. Now, for a new Christian, when they hear those words, 
You say, oh, last days. That means these are the last six months of our life. No, no. Last days means the last 2,000 years. That they made it sound like a, with a sense of urgency, like a, this is the last days, not 20 years ago, but now. It's not true, okay? Because even if the world ends tomorrow or 1,000 years from now, your end might end, might end tomorrow. I mean, your life might end tomorrow. You can get hit by a truck tomorrow. So you have to be ready to go anytime. So it doesn't matter what the media, it doesn't matter what people say. Uh, you have to be ready constantly uh, because your end might come any minute, whether you're young or old. Uh, but no man knows when eternity will invade his life. And God is warning the careless to prepare to meet his God and encourage the oppressed with the thought of the coming glory for the faithful soul. There is another warning here. The recent Christ beats the Philadelphians to hold on to what they have. So this is a very hopeful warning to the Philadelphians. It's a, one of the two churches that, that they tell him, you're doing okay, keep doing what they're doing. To hold on to what they have, that no one might take the crown. It is not a question of someone stealing their crown, but of, of God taking it from them and giving it to someone else, because they were not worthy to wear it. There is a list you know, in the Bible, there's people in the Bible that lost their place because they have shown that they are not fit to hold it. Esau lost his place to Jacob. That was the brother of Jacob. Reuben, an stable as well, lost his place to Judah. Uh, Saul lost his place to David. Judah's place to Matthias. And the Jews lost their place to the Gentiles. So a lot of people who were originally named to do something, they lost their place because they were not worth it. There's a tragedy here. It sometimes happens that a man is given a task to do and goes towards it with the highest hopes. But it begins to be seen that he's too small for the task. And he's removed from the task and is given somebody, somebody else. That can happen with the task of God. God has a task for every man, but it may be that that man proves himself unfit for the task and is given to another. Uh, there is a uh, point I want to make, which is a little related to this, but in that, uh, there's a book that came out a few years ago. Years, when I say a few years ago, it's more than 30 years ago. But sometimes you think like that. It was called the Peter Principle. Mm -hmm. The what principle? Peter Principle. Oh. And uh, the, the main point of the book is that everybody raises or rises to the level of incompetence. Let's say you are a mayor of this city, and you are a good mayor. You say, hey, maybe you, know, maybe you should run for governor. And the guy runs for governor, and he's a lousy governor. He should stay as mayor. And they say, all these people, everybody rises to the level. That's why we are governed by a bunch of incompetence. Yeah. Everybody rises to the level of incompetence. That's, that was the point of the book, the main point, <laughs> Peter Principle. OK, so the Christian must always be ready for Jesus' coming. Christ's return with expect suddenness is an incentive to persevere in faithful service. Right. Through misconduct, one can lose a crown that has been provided previously attained. The crown signifies the royal authority given to the victorious co of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ will be an occasion of either reward or regret. Though salvation can be lost, a reward can be. This is what we said before. You're not going to be judged whether you're saved or not. You're going to be judged or rewards you're going to get after you were saved. You say your salvation is assured. Not the unbelievers is another story. Here Christ promised the Philadelphians that he's coming quickly and they are to hold fast to what they have. In other words, they are to persevere in the midst of trial. His coming quickly does not refer to the final return because he's promised that more than a dozen years. It must instead refer to the he will shortly come by the power of the Spirit. So he's warning the Philadelphians there is a trial to come in. The promise of this verse is not that they will escape tribulation, but that Christ will strengthen them so that we we'll be kept spiritually safe through it. Christ's promise here does becomes relevant for believers of any age through trial. Christ will allow, always come and strengthen them in it. Now what I'm trying to say is this, when you have problems, I, I heard some, a pastor say uh, a few years ago, he said, if you don't have any problems in your life, drop on your knees and pray to the Lord to give you problems. <laughs> so when you have problems in your life, God is not going to remove the problems of your life. Christ is not a bridge over the problems. It's a tunnel to your problems. You're going to go through the problem, but you're going to go with Christ. Okay? 
and you're going to be better for it. Okay, it's blessed true that even out of failure a man can redeem himself, but only if he casts himself upon the grace of Jesus Christ. Wanda, verse 12, please. Finally got to you, huh? <laughs> Very good. So let me take the first, uh, the first paragraph, the first sentence. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of God. And you know what a pillar is, right? Pillar are columns, the structural columns that support the structure. Sometimes, you know, you put them closer to make it even stronger. Or sometimes you put cross bracing. Have you seen those buildings in New York City? The slender, like that, you know? Those things are really structurally very sound because they put cross bracing. So the wing is not going to sway. But uh, I hate to live in the top floor, though. I mean, you open the window, and you can see clouds there. Anyway, and they're very expensive, too, of course. OK, so the faithful Christian will be a pillar in the temple of God. A pillar in the church is great and honor support. Peter, James, and John were the pillars of the early church. Uh, Abraham said the Jewish rabbis was a pillar of the world. And they said, never again will they leave it. This may be a promise of security. We know that for years, Philadelphia, that uh, church, was terrorized by earthquakes of the earth and, and how. When such signs come, its citizens fled into the open country to escape, but when the tremors ended, uncertainty came back. Life was lived in an atmosphere of security. There is for the faithful Christian the promise of settled serenity in the peace which Jesus can give. I don't know if you've ever been in an earthquake, but I've been in a few earthquakes. I was growing up because I, I, I I grew up in a place where there were earthquakes. And uh, one day I was coming from school, I was walking, and then I see a building, and the, the window was shutting. I didn't know what it was, because I didn't, I didn't see anything else. But then I saw people coming out of the houses in mass, kneeling on the road and praying to God. Then I knew what was happening. It was an earthquake. But that's how people react. They remember God when the Earthquake strikes, you know, we should be ready for, for this. And uh, that, that's a, a terrible, a, a horrible situation because of the uncertainty of the earthquake. I mean, a tornado you can predict, a hurricane you can predict, but an earthquake you cannot predict. All of a sudden you start moving, and you don't know if it's going to stop in a few seconds or in a, a few minutes. Then when things start falling down, that's, that's bad. Some scholars think that what is promised here refers to moral character. In this life, even in the best of us, the best of us is sometimes bad. But he who is faithful will in the end come to a time when he's a pillar fixing the temple of God, a goodness has become the constant rule of his life. If this is the meaning, this phrase describes the life of untroubled goodness, which is lived then after the battle of earth, which is the presence of God. Now this is the, pro the process of sanctification. You know, uh, sanctification, it comes through all your life. The, the next, uh, Sentence is, um, I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. Number one, in the city of Asia Minor, Minor, and in Philadelphia, when a priest died, after a lifetime of faithfulness, men honor him by erecting a new pillar in the temple in which he has served and by inscribing his name and the name of his father upon it. This name would describe the lasting honor which Christ pays to his faithful ones. Number two, it is possible that there is a reference to the cost of branding a slave with the initial of his owner to show that he belongs to him. You know, in the, uh, in, in the Old Testament, when you were a slave, they say for seven years, and then you were free, the slave would say, I don't want to be free. I like this household. I want to remain here as a slave because you treat me well. So they, they put like a branding and they put that earring, which means you're a slave. That's what it meant in the Old Testament. Of course, now it means something else. Uh, just so, you know, <clears throat> it's possible that there is a reference to the cost of branding a slave with the initials of his owner to show that he belongs to him. Just so God will put his mark on, upon his faithful ones. Whichever picture is behind this, the sense is that the faithful ones will wear the 
unmistakable batch of gas. Number three, it is just possible that we have here an Old Testament picture. When God told to Moses the blessing which Aaron and the priest must pronounce over the people, he said, they shall put my name upon the people of Israel. It is the same idea again. It is the mark of God was upon Israel so that all men may know that they are his people. <clears throat> the next sentence is the new Jerusalem which is coming down out of heaven from my God. On the faithful Christian, the name of the new Jerusalem is to be written. That stands for the gift of citizenship in the city of God to the faithful Christian. According to Ezekiel, the name of the recreated city of God must to be wants to be the Lord is there. In Ezekiel says that the Lord is there, Ezekiel 48, 35. The faithful ones will be citizens of the city where there is always the presence of God. Can you imagine that? You live in the city where God is always there, physically. That will be awesome. Next sentence, and I will also write on them my new name. The people of Philadelphia knew all about taking a new name. When in AD 17, a terrible earthquake devastated the city, and Tiberius, the emperor, dealt kindly with them, suppressing taxation and making a generous gift to rebuild it. They, in their gratitude, called the city New Caesarea, the new city for Caesar. And later, when Vespasian, also was an emperor, was kind to them, they called it Flavia, for that was the family name of Vespasian. Jesus Christ will mark his faithful ones with his new name. What that name is going to be, we don't even know, you know, want to speculate, for no, no man knows it. But in the time to come, when Christ has conquered all, his faithful ones will bear the badge which shows that they are his and share his trial. The last verse is verse 13. He says, whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The saints, the believers, we are saints, <clears throat> are given to the concluding exhortation to hear what the Spirit says because they need a spiritual discernment in the midst of the affliction which they are about to endure in order not to deny Christ's name and thus inherit the final reward. If they are not to be heavily minded and focused on the final reward, they will be tempted to conform themselves to earthly circumstances around them, which includes compromising their faith because of persecution. This is what we talked about before <clears throat> when we started <clears throat> the lesson. The common element in all the churches is, is compromise. They let the world infiltrate in the church. Instead of they affecting the world, the world is affecting them. So we make compromise. We allow things that we're not supposed to allow. It. Uh, just to be seeker friendly, to get more people. It's a numbers game. And that's not right. Okay? Compromise is a common element of everybody. Openness to the truth of the Word of God is a necessity for understanding the special destiny for the overcoming Christian. Now, as a final thing, <clears throat> a few thoughts about the church in Philadelphia. Christ commands the church of Philadelphia for his persevering witness, in which he will empower his members further and encourage them to persevere so as to inherit end-time fellowship and an education of him. Uh, let's jump to the second, third paragraph. These verses that we read speak of testing as a form of God's judgment on the lost. This must refer to events which, however, necessarily affect believers and unbelievers alike. Economic trials, warfare, climatic catastrophe, and so on. <clears throat> so the question is, how then can it be said that God keeps believers safe from such events? Now, when, when the 9-11 towers fell, who knows how many Christians were there? How come they died and we didn't die? We could have been there, you know? So many Christians, so many believers were there. So God, something allows things. Sometimes we don't understand, you know? So uh, a catastrophe can affect believers and non-believers alike. Could it be said that believers are kept safe even if they die in such calamitous time? They're safe with God, yeah. Have you noticed a difference in how believers and non-believers respond to the same difficult events, such a natural result. I mentioned before, uh, the, when it's an earthquake happens, everybody goes out to the street to kneel and pray to God, because that's when they remember God more than any other time. How might this reveal the judgment of God in one hand and on the other, the refining work of God with respect to believers? So, in conclusion, that many churches today, our church, the Christian community in Philadelphia, it was small, in his own eyes, as well as the eyes of others. It may have seemed insignificant and perhaps some in it 
facing persecution, wonder whether God has even forgotten them. Yet, this church receives a special commendation and promises from God. So, does our Christian culture place too much significance on size? How can the church in Philadelphia be an encouragement to us when either as individuals or as a church community when we feel insignificant or even forgotten by God? We are in this church, you know, First Baptist Church, which are very small in numbers, okay? It wasn't like that before the pandemic, but we are, but it doesn't matter. Because even in this room, the Spirit of the Lord is here, you know? Uh, it doesn't matter if it's one or if it's a hundred. The Lord is here, and the Lord gives us encouragement. And that we as individuals, as individuals, must carry on the task of God. Any questions about this or any other thing? Nico, any question? Okay, let's, let's finish this with a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to, uh, uh, to go through another lesson, especially this, uh, the Church of Philadelphia, which was commended for the good works and their endurance. Also, at the same time, uh, uh, help us to endure whatever trials we're going to face in this church, dear Lord, either today or the coming week or coming days, dear Lord. And uh, we come into the Christmas uh, season and we are being bombarded by uh, by gifts and things that are not necessarily anti-Christian. So help us to be to keep our serenity, our cool in the sense, you know, and respond appropriately with love to what's happening around us. Thank you, Lord, for this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let me let me finish with this.